afternoon. Welcome to the Miles Nadal JCC. My name is Lisa Roy. I'm the manager of Adult Daytime Culture and Education at the Miles Nadal Jewish Community Center, which is located in downtown Toronto. It is wonderful seeing so many familiar faces back in our building. A special welcome to all of our distinguished guests and a warm hello to our at-home virtual audience. It is my pleasure to be hosting today's program from Brunswick to Bloor, the history of the Miles Nadal JCC with guest speaker Sharoni Sibini. This event is being held in commemoration of our JCC's milestone anniversary. We are celebrating 70 years at the corner of Spadina and Bloor. <laughs> Traditionally named Turtle Island, some thousands of years ago, the land upon which our community center sits is appropriately known as the gathering place in the dish with one spoon territory. Spadina, derived from the Anishinaabe word Ishpadina, meaning high hill or getting up the hill, is the name of an ancient indigenous trail. We are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, meet, and learn on this territory. May we aspire to learn more about the indigenous people's history as it is forever intertwined with our own. Today's program is supported by a Resilient Communities Fund grant from the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and it is presented in partnership with the Ontario Jewish Archives. Thank you to my wonderful JCC colleagues, our technical staff, Peter Fellhaber, Jake Rolls, Patrick Lemieux, Ariel Reutemann, and Shea Santati, who is here with us in the room today for their support of this multi-access event. Maxine Bailey, Deanna DiLello, who is hosting our Zoom room, and our very dedicated volunteers, Rhoda Sion, Cheryl Zimmerman, Phyllis Panett, and Pauline Farber. A reminder for those of you in the room, kindly turn your cell phones to vibrate or to off so we do not disturb today's event. And if you have a question for Sharoni, either here or in our Zoom room, she will answer them at the end of the lecture. And now, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce our beloved Executive Director of the Miles Nadal JCC, Harriet Witchin. I'm thrilled to welcome you online and in person to this milestone event celebrating the 70th anniversary at the corner of Bloor and Spadina, making memories and building community. I'd like to acknowledge some of our special guests today in the room and online, including Adam Minsky, President and CEO of UJA Federation of Greater Toronto, a constant supporter of our mission and everything we do. Our former Executive Director, Ellen Cole, current Board Chair, Brian Pouquier, Former board chairs, Frank Jacobs, Harold Wolkin, and Jody Shanoff, and board member, Natalie Fingerhut. Today's event is one of several that will be happening over 2023 to celebrate. Look forward to an open house in the fall. It is also my pleasure to introduce a recorded greeting from our leading philanthropist and benefactor, Miles Nadal. Miles' commitment to the JCC is unwavering, and I look forward to hearing his greetings with you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the JCC in Toronto. Going back to 1854, the JCC movement has played a very valuable role, not only in helping immigrants get acclimated into their communities, but serving both Jewish and non-Jewish communities around the world, for that matter. I've had the privilege of association for 57 years as I was subsidized to go to summer camp at the JCC when I was eight years of age. And from that point forward, it made me really committed that when I had an opportunity to give back to the community and to support the JCC, I would do so. My family and I have had the privilege of being able to contribute time, talent, and treasure to the benefit of many institutions and charitable organizations, and none is more important, memorable, or emotionally important to us as a family than the JCC. We look forward to continuing our support and hope to celebrate many more milestones of the JCC's success in serving the communities for the next number of decades. Thank you again.
congratulations on the 70th anniversary. On behalf of the whole Nadell family, we say congratulations. Thank you so much, Harriet and Miles. When I was perusing our archives in preparation for this event, I discovered a UJA fundraising package titled Jewish Toronto Tomorrow. At that time, it was a glimpse of the vision to build what was then to be called the Miles S. Nadell Jewish Community Centre. In that documentation, Miles is quoted as saying the following, Jewish Toronto Tomorrow is this new vision of partnership and progress. It has given me the opportunity to ensure the continued vitality of our future by refurbishing an institution of our past and by reinvigorating a facility which benefits not just Jewish Toronto, but indeed the entire city. Prophetic words, indeed. On behalf of those of us who are lucky enough to call our downtown Jewish community center our second home, we are grateful for your transformative and lasting legacy. And now, <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Sharoni Sibini is an experienced educator across multiple disciplines. She has worked and volunteered in Jewish educational programming and event management at Holy Blossom Temple, the Ashkenaz Festival, Limud Toronto, the Ontario Jewish Archives, and of course, the Jewish Community Centers of Toronto. Sharoni has been a lecturer, tour guide, pottery instructor, and book club facilitator in Toronto various venues, and she is a facilitator with the Jewish Studio Project. At RJCC, Sharoni was previously the manager of the Jewish Life Department and coordinator of the Downtown Jewish Community Council, and she recently returned to helm our signature community event, Tikkun Leil Shavuot. I know that we're all in for a real treat this afternoon. Please join me in a very warm JCC welcome for Sharoni. So, hi, I'm Sharoni, and I just want to start by thanking Lisa, as she's stepping out of the room, for the invitation to dig deeper into the story of this organization that I love so much, um, and for the chance to, to share this story with all of you here and at home. Hi. Um, I also want to start with a caveat, because I was talking to a few of you as, I, as you came in, and I want to say that um, I can't promise that this will be the most comprehensive opportunity to see pictures of people you've known and loved. I've picked a few things out of the archives, but we only have an hour. So I'm hoping that at some point uh, we'll have a chance to wander around afterwards and share stories, and um, I'll get to hear from you about some of the, the personalities that you've known here over the years. Um, I'd love to start for a moment by asking you to turn to a neighbor and just share with somebody, ideally somebody you don't know yet that you could introduce yourself to, um, one memory that you have that brought you here today that motivates you to connect with the JCC. Just take a, a brief moment and uh, for the folks at home, I would love for you to write that into the chat so you can each see each other's memories a little bit in action. Fantastic. Okay, that was, that was great. You all had so much to say, obviously. Um, I hope that I'll have a chance to hear some of those memories come forward from you at the end of the talk or maybe in the Q&A if you want to share something. Um, I wanted to start today by saying that a funny premise to start with, there's nothing more dangerous to society than bored young men with nothing to do and no social network to catch them. So thank God for the why, where guys with nicknames like Spider and the Mole, Itch, the Apple, the Boston Bachelor and the Schnoz spent their time and formed the bonds of a lifetime. Bonds that lasted 70 years or more. Clubs like Kenton, Du Maurier and Orion, the last one also known as the College Street Cowboys, and you can see them here um, where they're at the Toronto Island in 1920, looking very fit. Uh, they pulled their groups of people together from College Street Corridor, from Spadina Avenue, from Kensington Market, into all kinds of organized sports activities and social events that cemented family-like relationships for them. And often, those relationships, uh, other relationships often led to marriage too, especially when they had formal dances at venues like the Palais Royal or the Royal York Hotel Main Hall before they had them here. When the summer heat got unbearable, 
they'd hop on a train or pile in a half ton truck together and they'd head to a resort town like Pontypool, right? And uh, <laughs> great, this is a great cheering crowd, I love it. Um, be enthusiastic, this is our anniversary celebration. So let's hear the enthusiasm when you recognize things. Um, they might've gone to Jackson's Point on Lake Simcoe or Crystal Beach, right? All of these places that afforded a bit of a respite for Jews a short distance from the city. Or if they were lucky, they might've even gotten a job at one of the summer camps like Northland, right? If they were also lucky, their comings and goings might have been listed in the Toronto social pages of the Canadian Jewish Review or the Canadian Jewish Chronicle. And often these papers were rife with things like telling you who had just gone on vacation to Muskoka or who was coming back from a vacation at the Monteith Inn, right? Um, but in the case of groups like the Orion Club, the one I mentioned was also known as the College Street Cowboys. You might have seen things like they had a supper dance party. This is um, 1939, this document, right? So they had a supper dance party at a place called, what was it called? Thank you, Silver Slipper, I just forgot. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it tells you who, who were the main attendees. I'm not sure how somebody got their name in that listing specifically, but that was glamorous, right? So if you had the opportunity to join us last week here for Doron Krakauer's lecture on the history of the JCC movement, you know that Jewish communities have a long and somewhat common history across North America. Um, even though there are many different iterations of JCCs today, they have certain common themes and ours is certainly like a lot of the American JCCs that Doron discussed. So our why would also become a site of settlement services, English language classes for newcomers, in the war years for war recruitment, and also home front efforts to support the war effort, cultural and educational development, and social service supports for a community in a constant state of evolution and growth over really well more than a century. I know we're celebrating 70 years today, but I'm talking a little bit, I'm gonna take, take us a little bit further back. So this organization has evolved to serve a lot of different needs with each passing generation and to change with the trends of the time and the neighborhood. Like a lot of the JCCs that Doron taught us about last week, the Miles Nadel JCC has its roots in the YMHA movement. That's the Young Men's Hebrew Athl Athletics Association, right at the turn of the 20th century. So the Young Men's Hebrew Athletic Club Limited is the earliest documented Jewish athletic club in the city. And we can see here that it was granted a letters patent under King Edward VII um, in 1901, right? right on the cusp of the century. But the JCC that we know and love today was very early on built up as a community center of micro communities. And Doron talked a little bit about this idea that it was always a community of communities. And right from the start, it was bringing together a variety of different boys and girls athletics clubs, each with their own leadership, with their own sports heroes, and with their own burgeoning social activities. In the early 1900s, Toronto was the city of churches a very prim and proper place governed by an Anglican elite, closed on the Lord's Day, striving for temperance even before the introduction of, of, of an official temperance act in 1916. And often the elite was very worried about the immigrant working class folks who pushed at its self-perceived boundaries of gentility and decorum. Evangelical Christian agencies established settlement houses in the ward. Do you know all, all about the ward? Anybody here? not know? Okay, so the ward was the area that Jews lived in before Kensington Market, um, where a lot of Eastern European immigrant Jews settled first in the 1880s, 18, 1890s and early 1900s especially, and today it would be the area that is, uh, that's been replaced really by City Hall, some of the hospitals, and the Eaton Center, like that part of the city, right, down by Elizabeth Street. So um, that neighborhood was a, was a site of interest for evangelical Christian missionizing organizations. No, it was, it, it was affordable and poor conditions generally. Um, it was affordable area, it is where they landed a lot of the time, and not just Jews, other immigrant groups also lived there and a lot of early uh, Toronto black folks moved into that area if they came up either through the Underground Railroad or by some other means, right? 
And um, anyway, so they're pulling, uh, the evangelical Christian agencies are setting up these settlement house services where they actually move into a neighborhood and have nurse practitioners and other folks who live in the neighborhood with people and provide all kinds of services like uh, medical dispensaries and um, baby support services for new moms and also a lot of uh, after school clubs for kids because these are ways to connect with the community and support them, but also start to inculcate Christian values, right? And so they're pulling first in the ward and then also in Kensington Market, there are a bunch of places that start with the same kind of, or that develop the same kind of agenda as immigrant groups move in. So it was really important to keep kids off of the streets and back alleys. Can you imagine what it was like when people were running around with horses and buggies and the very first automobiles too, right? The first automobiles were hard to control. And so there was a lot of debate about that. So people were creating these uh, playground leagues. And this one is here on Elizabeth Street. This is a picture from that area called The Ward. And um, this one is a picture from 1913 where they had their inaugural demonstration day. I think we take for granted that that parks have playgrounds in cities, but we forget that that was a very specific mission that people developed that was championed by social reformers in the early 20th century and that reflected changing ideals about what a childhood meant, right? It was moving away from this Victorian idea that children should be seen and not heard and moving toward an idea of a more vital, autonomous childhood and giving kids safe spaces to play and giving them some structured activities was part of the background thinking that would develop into some of the early YMHA activities. So this one is on Elizabeth Street, which is like sort of beside the courthouse now near the Eaton Center, just south of City Hall, let's say, south of the old City Hall. So I was mentioning that there were these playground leagues where people would make an effort to create outdoor play spaces and get the kids off the street and out of the alleys. Um, and in addition to the shift from parks to playgrounds, we also had community groups that started to establish their own sports leagues with accessible, affordable sports like baseball, basketball, boxing, wrestling, and even early hockey, which was a lot more affordable then than it is now because it didn't have the same standards of equipment that it has now, right? So sometimes they were building upon sporting traditions that they had brought with them from Europe, especially wrestling and boxing and weightlifting, strongman kind of activities. Um, and sometimes they were adopting new Canadian sporting cultures. And this was part of what they, you know, part of that, um, what Doron last week called Americanization, what we can rightly call Canadianization in our context. And yes, it is a word. Um, in addition to the early YMHA, the Judean Athletic Club was established in 1908, and then it was followed by the Hebrew Literary and Athletic Club in 1914, and then other kinds of girls' clubs, looking very serious sometimes, um, and then also specifically boys' clubs. I think they look a little more impish than the girls. And then here is the Hebrew Literary and Athletic Club picture. On the cusp of World War I, a broader community center movement was kind of falling apart in Toronto and elsewhere. Jewish people in many North American cities had previously been able to participate in and had even made significant financial and volunteer contributions to programs at their local YMCAs, the Christian Athletics Associations. Other Christian settlement house services, like these rec centers and after-school programs that I mentioned that were run by churches of various sorts. By the late 1910s, though, these rec centers were already becoming the site of new anti-Semitic activity or discourse. And actually, I found an article from 1912 in the archives. So as early as 1912 in Toronto, we're seeing in one of our local papers that the leadership of the Toronto YMCA was instituting policies that would, quote, segregate their 400 Hebrew members. And that was in line with policies they already had about barring Unitarians from the YMCAs. That segregationist policy was ultimately instituted in 1918 in Toronto, which obviously infuriated the Jews, especially those who had served in World War I. As they're coming back from World War I, as the war is ending, that makes sense, um, they're being driven out of the YMCAs and they're starting to form their own Hebrew Association of Young Men's and Young Women's Clubs in 1919, which is like an umbrella organization, right? 
They have some maybe marginal leadership from Dr. Rabbi Abraham A. Price at the University Avenue Synagogue, which was not far from the, like was in the neighborhood. And the association amalgamated 21 different clubs, offering them operational support and access to rental facilities while letting them retain control over their own programming. And I think maybe the clubs were used to competing with each other because a lot of the records show that there was a fair bit of infighting and it took, a, a, a infighting plus economic depression in the 20s took another decade before they could agree to pool their resources and then raise more funds for a dedicated YMHA facility. As an amalgamated organization, the YMHA started out by using the facilities of the Brunswick Avenue Talmud Torah, which was a Jewish school for boys, and it had a gym and a swimming pool that they could access after school and on weekends. Yeah, you know it? <laughs> yeah, right at Brunswick in college. You know where, um, if you know the neighborhood today, that's where the um, Kensington Place Senior Care Facility is? It's the same physical location. The facility uh, on Brunswick, this is I guess predates this building, it would have had a gym and a swimming pool that they could access, like I said, after school and on weekends. And in return for use of the space, the Y leadership, who were pretty much all volunteers, not staff, provided athletic training for the school's students. And the club was entirely focused on youth activities and originally had only occasional advice from its adult advisory board. The kids mostly ran themselves, until they were able to attract leadership from young businessmen and professionals, which was going to professionalize the organization in a new way. So by the mid-1920s, the YMYWHA leadership expanded the mission and vision of the organization to start including all adult social and recreational groups, and now that meant that 70 new groups affiliated with the Y. The Y leadership even envisioned a robust community center that would have absorbed the Talmud Torah operations into one common organization and one building. But the Talmud Torah team didn't go for it. They wanted to keep themselves separate. But they did create instead a liaison system between the two organizations, and they built a corridor between the two buildings to facilitate the physical education of the kids at the Talmud Torah school. And I think what's really cool is that we've managed to uh, basically manifest this shared building vision over the last few years with the mixed use of our own space here in the JCC facility by the Paul Penna Downtown Jewish Day School during the day and until just last month by the Downtown Jewish Community School as an after school. But those schools are run independently, so they, nobody's, um, nobody's tried to amalgamate the organizational structures. We, they rent the space, They're t or tenants of the space, right? So even with the limited space of the Brunswick facility, the Y produced several championship teams in basketball, swimming, boxing, weightlifting, and wrestling. So here you've got your great strongman team, the weightlifting team. They were the first Canadian all-Jewish weightlifting club, and this picture is from 1936. And you can see, I guess, the guy on the left is their coach. He looks like he's probably the most built out of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so he's packed in tight there. And, uh, <laughs> and the club produced its heroes, right? You'd have people like Fanny, who was better known as Bobby Rosenfeld. And there she is in her Patterson's t-shirt around 1928. She started out, of course, in basketball at the YWH, YWHA and went on to a gold medal track career in the Olympics. And Sammy Leftspring, a boxer who would have been Canada's best chance for gold in the 1936 Olympics. But where were the 1936 Olympics? In Berlin. So he boycotted. And he was uh, pressured a little bit by our Congress, Canadian Jewish Congress, into boycotting. And he was kind of given an education at that moment about what was going on in the world. And he decided instead to go to the People's Olympics in Barcelona, where he was, it was part of an alternative Olympics that he was meant to compete in. And then, of course, like the day they get to Barcelona, what happens? Spanish Civil War breaks out. Yeah, <laughs> so, so it's not a good time to be in Barcelona, so he reroutes to Paris. I think he said he met Marlene Dietrich on the Champs-Élysées, <laughs> so it worked out okay for him. Um, <laughs> he's got a really good memoir that you can see at the Toronto Reference Library, by the way. So athletic clubs um, really 
were reinforcing Jewish identity and pride, especially when they signaled their Jewishness on their shorts, like with the Magen David, the Star of David, right? And athletic activities also were serving as a tool for acculturation to Canadian society among, this, among these children of immigrants, some of whom, many of whom, were immigrants themselves. And sports were teaching people about Canadian social expectations and behavioral norms. They were facilitating the development of cross-cultural relationships. And they were helping Jewish youth learn about and contribute to Canadian popular culture. I would say Sammy was probably one of the, Sammy and Bobby both, were best known, right? Sammy said he was in the newspaper more often than the mayor. And if you look back at the newspaper archives from the city in those years, he was in the newspaper almost every day because he was constantly in some kind of match or another, right? So these guys were really well known on a, on a broader front than just the why. Um, by the late 1920s, the club's programming shifted to be mainly geared to boys, probably as an outgrowth of the relationship with the Talmud Torah school. And they had dropped a lot of the girls' activities, I think all of the girls' activities. And they eventually incorporated as the Young Men's Hebrew Association in 1930 and would only bring back women's athletics in the late 1930s when they opened their first purpose-built facility to the public in 1937. And back then, an athletic membership cost about $25 a year. So how are you feeling about inflation now? <laughs> Anybody here have a fitness center membership downstairs? Yeah, <laughs> slightly different. So the Y produced this annual yearbook for a number of years. And I want to distinguish this from the annual program guides we produce today, which now tend to highlight our programs and services. But back then, these were a treasure trove. I had so much fun going through the archives for these. Uh, personalities and insights into the clubbishness and the insider status that people felt. And they really paint a picture of a tight-knit youth movement that grew its own leadership. So this is part of the 1937 issue. Um, <laughs> This one celebrated the suave, suave and calm lawyer Percy Shulman, who helmed the organization in 1930, uh, did I say 37? Yeah, this is 1937. And then I think they probably, I think this guy probably wrote his own description. Percy Kaplan is mentioned here on the right side, on the right hand column. Percy Kaplan was the yearbook editor and he wrote, I'm, I'm assuming it was him himself, but maybe somebody else wrote it for him, that he was nervous and excitable, always on the verge of throwing everything up and, st and still continuing very staunchly with his tasks. So I think that spirit of that clubbishness, that insider status, that kind of cute, uh, playful tone that they had with each other continued, that spirit continued long past the 1930s. And I was downstairs in our fitness center in the, I don't know if you've been down to the um, display cabinet that we have in the athletic center. I took this very bad picture, but it's, um, you know, this is from the 1978 anniversary dinner and the guys are still kind of in that same vein saying things like Fred Title was the source of everything no one else could obtain or Kiva Barkin who ensured everything we did was legal or at least told us it was, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> um, this is our immunity. <laughs> so 1936 to 37 would turn out to be a turning point year for the Y, because it was also introducing a range of cultural offerings as it moved into the new facility, and that's now the facility on Brunswick, right? Now, it had more than a single shower. This is very exciting. You should see the, I didn't pull it in. There's a picture of like all the guys crowding around in the old facility, <laughs> like, like smushed in like sausages to try to get into the locker room. Um, now, in 1937, in the new facility on Brunswick, your membership would have entitled you not only to athletics, but also to a drama club and to public speaking classes and to a range of lectures on Jewish culture and global affairs, a lot of political talks and I think possibly the least gleeful looking glee club. <laughs> it's a really great picture. <laughs> um, incidentally, the yearbook also generated a ton of ad revenue, which helped with overall operations costs for the organization. And I picked a couple of my favorite ads. Um, of course, the Victory Florist would advertise in the yearbook to remind you to get your corsage for the Y dance. And Koffler's, you know, Murray Koffler was, that's the precursor to Shoppers that would become Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, he was just down the street from the Y and he, he would offer all your athletic supports, <laughs> important, um, <laughs> and uh, anything you needed for your gym workout and really also for your injury treatment, for all your pain relief too. The new facilities, of course, um, 
with the, with the new facilities, I should say, um, and you've got a whole bunch of new things going on. The return of women's athletics, an intensified boys athletics schedule with new classes in athletics, a whole bunch of new cultural programs that they started to develop. And of course, this would all result in new membership, higher membership levels. And so this bulletin from 1937 reports that they had a, pr a specific jump to 800 people over 350 just a few years earlier. So they really managed to pull a lot of people into the organization. Okay, but then of course, we're in the late 30s and the Second World War starts. And the yearbooks are gonna change in tone as the boys join the service and the girls have to focus their energies on salvage collection, first aid lessons, fundraising, and this one I, f I pulled from the Montreal version of the bulletin, right? The Montreal YWHA chapter was issuing a campaign of self-denial, that is to reroute the funds they would spend on luxury items and bring them instead into the war chest. And when Canada joined the war effort, Ottawa required proof that at least 1,000 Jewish servicemen were in uniform before the government would appoint a Jewish chaplain to be part of the service. And at the same time, the newspapers of the day were reporting that Jews weren't doing their part in the war effort. So last week, Doron told us that um, there was a sort of enthusiasm from Canadian Jewish Congress. I think there was anxiety and enthusiasm from places like Canadian Jewish Congress and established leaders in the community um, to really encourage more recruitment of young men to go join the war effort for the Second World War. And then in this case, um, you'd see like the Canada Adler, the Yiddish, the most famous Yiddish uh, Canadian paper, which means Canadian Eagle. Uh, the editor was writing letters and uh, not letters, but like public uh, messages to encourage people to sign up for the war. And um, the organization even sent Rabbi David Monson. Oh, there's a, a uh, people remember David Monson, that's lovely. He was at Sherry Shemaim, yeah, who also, he also was on the board of the Brunswick Avenue Talmud Torah, so he was sent out on campaigns to recruit young people at the Y and other Jewish clubs. He was also at Beth Shalom at one point? Okay, great, yeah. Um, on the home front, the Y clubs also volunteered to help Congress program activities and offered meals and entertainment for visiting servicemen before they headed overseas. And of course, I'm sure you've walked by it many times if you've come into the building. I don't know for the folks at home if you've been in the building, but the building that we're in now, which as you said was the Bloor Y or the South Y, was opened in 1953 and it was specifically dedicated to the fallen Jewish soldiers who gave their lives in service to their country. And that memory of war service has remained a really tangible presence in the Miles Nadel JCC. For many years, I was in charge of organizing and supporting our annual Remembrance Day services on the front steps outside of Spadina Avenue with the General Wingate Branch. They were the Jewish Brigade of the Royal Canadian Legion. Um, and of course, also we have inside the building the Michael Bernstein Chapel on the third floor, which is named for the fallen brother of longtime members and members and leaders here, Leonard and Coleman Bernstein, now gone too. And this is uh, Michael's obituary from 1944. He died in service in Italy. In the immediate post-war years, the Y Overseas Club started to offer services to recent immigrants most of whom, of course, were Holocaust survivors, and especially in Toronto. We have a lot of people here with that unfortunate, sad legacy. And these folks received membership privileges, English classes, and the benefits of social clubs and camps for their kids, creating a new extended family for people whose social networks had really been decimated. After the move to Bloor, the Y strategic direction evolved to be more like the Y we know today, the why I've worked for, um, attending to the needs of family, ch families, children, and seniors, and increasing also its non-athletic programming. It promoted itself as the why for everyone, and it had now, by the 50s, maybe early 60s, over 130 clubs and affiliate interest groups. And there were more than 25 cultural courses and workshops that included through the Y Arts Council, especially this, this is an issue from 1963 to 64, this is like the program guide of all the cultural educational offerings. Um, they included photography, dramatics, woodworking even, art, Hebrew and Yiddish languages, still some English language, and the Y, um, by many accounts, was also the birthplace of interpretive dance. And at first I looked at this and I thought, oh, 
interpretive dance? That sounds so funny today. Um, <laughs> but actually, I think it's very amazing because at, at the bottom, I think it's the bottom, let me see. Yeah, on the lower, like sort of three quarters of the way down, it specifies that there was a choreography training workshop here. It was training choreographers. And among the people that we trained here at this Y was David Earle, who went on to co-found the Toronto Dance Theatre, um, and also incidentally brought Martha Graham's choreography to the city as he was himself becoming a very well, um, a pioneer of contemporary dance himself, right? This is a picture of one of his pieces, more recent, but still. The Y also took on the mantle of administering the Jewish Camp Council, and it developed new day camps like Camp Playtime, Playtime, of course, with a Y, and uh, I swear, despite this picture, the kids had fun. They must have. <laughs> they kept coming back. <laughs> The leadership continued the tradition of those social dances, and they brought them into this facility on Bloor. And they were so popular here that they actually had to turn people away at the door sometimes. And the Y also offered new sports like tennis, judo, judo, what did people know from judo, right? Squash and badminton. And then we added massage and steam rooms and a, roof, a rooftop solarium for sunbathing. You want to bring that back? Yeah, sounds good, right? <laughs> The Y had always been open to everyone, but it wasn't until the 1950s that we start to see increased participation from non-Jewish members. We see it in places like the basketball teams, in intramural meets, other places like that. And the city and the, the neighborhood, the city in general, of course, is experiencing such a huge population shift in these years. Um, so much so that in 1974, the Toronto Star wrote that, and I quote this, I love this line, Toronto was once a mausoleum where nothing moved on Sunday but clergymen's lips. <laughs> Great line. Um, but then with that surge in immigration from all over the world, all of a sudden they said, the town's drab monotone was overlaid by a merge of color and tone and style and language that produced a whole new ambience. And I know we have fans of Caravan in the audience. That multicultural ambience took on the form once a year of the Metropolitan Toronto Caravan Festival, where communities across the city opened their doors and showcased the national folk musics and dance and food and crafts. And many of us had passports to go all around the world in our city, right? The Y opened its doors here on Bloor as the Jerusalem Pavilion. I couldn't find a picture of it, so if any of you have a picture, please share it with me after for the next version of this talk. Um, and uh, this is just one of the many programs I could have highlighted here to show that the Y was also taking on some responsibility for educating the general public about Jewish community and culture. Um, that was outreach work that it had been growing already since the 1950s. I just picked this one out of the many possibilities because it was probably my favorite. So over the years, and I'd love to hear from you about who you remember seeing and hearing here. Um, this place became a stopping ground for poets, playwrights, musicians, dancers, actors, and artists of all stripes. I remember coming across a piece in the archives that referenced the appearance here as part of a poetry series in 1960 of a young Leroy Jones. Does anybody know who Leroy Jones became? Leroy Jones became Amiri Baraka uh, when he became part of the Back to Africa movement, and he um, went on to be a poet laureate of the United States. I thought it was pretty neat that he made an appearance here in his youth. Um, probably not something he would do later in his career for other reasons, but um, <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of people who came through the doors here and got one of their early starts in this building, right? Through a workshop or the Canadian Jewish playwriting competition, or uh, maybe their film was screened at the Toronto Jewish Film Society. I mean, really, the possibilities are endless. We began a campaign in 2001 to do a major renovation project, which I think Lisa mentioned in her introduction, that was part of the Tomorrow campaign uh, that UJA Federation ran. And that was a major renovation project here, and then also to develop, um, to redevelop other campuses for other JCCs, but also to redevelop, um, or to, sorry, to develop the Wolfon Center, which is the home for campus Jewish life. 
um, at the University of Toronto. So that, that was part of the Tomorrow campaign, also the development of the Wolfon Center. And I will just say as a side note, thank God they built the Wolfon Center because I used to go to the Jewish Student Union in the basement of University College at U of T. Does, do you remember, Brian, what that was like? Do you remember the mice? <laughs> I remember the mice and the smelly old couches. <laughs> I loved it, but I, the, the Wolfon Center is much, much nicer. Um, so we officially reopened here in the summer of 2003, and we had space for our tenants, the Paul Penna Downtown Jewish Day School, and for a long time, the Second Cup. Uh, we developed the 288-seat Al Green Theatre. We improved our aerobic studios, and we created a chapel, that Michael Bernstein Chapel that I mentioned before, which, um, according to Coleman Bernstein, meant that the guys could come out of the supply closet where they used to pray, and <laughs> <laughs> have a proper place to pray. This is the Pray and Play Gang. This is a picture from 1980, a, a little article that was in the Toronto Star about how there were guys here that would come to pray and then play, right? So the, the chapel has never really offered Saturday morning like Shabbat services but or Friday night services, but it has been a steady place for weekday minions, including Sunday, um, by which I mean weekday congregational prayer service. And um, it's been a really important site for people. It's been a real community for, for the people who've joined it over the years. Um, we also developed offices and meeting rooms, and I think probably bolstered our staff at that point. And we were, of course, renamed the Miles Nadell Jewish Community Center after our wonderful chief benefactor. And then our membership soon tripled in size. So I'm coming to the end of my prepared remarks. Um, I will just say that over more than a century, really, because I know, again, I said we were starting with 70 years, but really this is a longer history of an organization. Our organization has helped people acculturate to Canadian life, to help find love, didn't work for me, but still, um, <laughs> and deep friendship. <laughs> what was that, Mike? <laughs> Um, to support people through so many stages of life, to encourage our welfare economically at various points in, in economic history, and of course our well-being holistically, and to develop community leaders and professional athletes, internationally renowned arts talents of various sorts. So as the, na the needs of this neighborhood around us are changing, and they're going to change again a lot in the next 10 years because it's being a, a very developed neighborhood, um, and as the broader downtown Jewish community continues to evolve, we helm here, we coordinate the Downtown Jewish Community Council, and we're paying attention to what's going on in the neighborhood. And we're really going to have to focus on strengthening our own traditions, but to find new ways to strengthen the community that's changing around us. So that's what I prepared about the 70 years, and I will just say to another 70 and another 70, and another 70 after that. <laughs> and yeah, I'm happy to take some questions. Oh, for folks at home, the person in the audience, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Peter is asking, um, what were the two buildings side by side on Brunswick? So there was the YMHA small fitness facility for the clubs, and then the bigger building was a purpose-built uh, Brunswick Avenue Talmud Torah. It was the school. It was a Jewish school. No, the Jewish school created a corridor physically so that the kids could go into the other building. The other building had this, yeah, yeah, the small building had a small gym. Yeah, I think a boxing ring, yeah. It was not a, it was not a robust facility like it is today, right? Like I said, they had a single shower, and then they were really happy when they moved here in the 50s. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody's asking if there were any pictures inside the building, and... Um, there certainly were. There were pictures of different clubs meeting and different activities in progress, that kind of thing. I do not have it handy, no. Um, I will recommend, just for continuing interest, two things that might be of interest to folks here. One is to check out the archives of the Ontario Jewish Archives, many of which, but not all of which, have been digitized. And so if you go to the website of Ontario Jewish Archives, org, I think, but I can't remember. Um, you can find lots of different materials. You can type YMHA into the search bar, for example, and you'll find some thumbnail pictures, um, and you'll start to see some of the, the history. They also, on their website, have a virtual exhibition about the history of the Y movement and specifically of this location. So I pulled a bunch of material from that exhibition um, and then tried to augment it in different ways. And um, 
And then we also do walking tours. I'm, I also work for the Ontario Jewish Archives leading walking tours. So uh, we do walking tours around Kensington Market and it's a good season for it now because it's the summer. So uh, Ellen Cole, our former executive director, is saying that when they built this building in 1953, um, Spadina ended at Bloor. And now you go from Spadina Avenue up into Spadina Road to signal, signal the difference. So this was the top. So for many years, they produced combined guides for that, that picture was um, the Y Arts Council picture with all the interpretive dance classes. Yeah, from 1963 to 64, they, they, for several years, they had published joint um, catalogs of what was coming up, right? They shifted out of that mode of the yearbook that really, like, it felt like a high school yearbook to read it, right? And to see the pictures of the people and to hear the, the little stories of, like, vignettes of their personalities. Um, and they shifted out of that into more of a program guide model. And they did that in combination, the two JCCs together, the Bluer Y and the Northern Y in Willowdale that would become now the Prosserman JCC. The Leah Poslin Theatre, to my knowledge, was only uptown, and so it wasn't part of the direct history of this location, but for sure it would have been included in um, whenever, when, I can't remember when it was built, it was an extension of the, of the North Y, um, and when it was established, it would have featured, and its activities would have featured in the program guides also, right? Yes, it now exists in the Sherman campus, yes. Oh, Lauren, Lauren, who um, runs a bunch of programs here, uh, asked me, what, has, what have we done in the past that we should be bringing back? Well, I heard specifically earlier today, uh, before we started, from somebody in the room, a request to bring back the drama club. Um, but I, I would say, actually, I think one of the things... Um, yeah. <laughs> One of the things that struck me as really vital to the history and success of this organization was the volunteerism. So I'm actually going to reframe that and say I think volunteerism in, in various ways. I think there, there's been a move in Jewish organizations, not just the JCC, but across the board, including in synagogues and stuff, to professionalize and hire staff. And so this presents you know, an opportunity and a challenge for resources. It meets a lot of really important needs um, for sustainability, but I also do think that the, the history of the spirit of volunteerism in those ways um, was so palpable in the pages of the archives, and it is far less palpable to me in the years that I've worked, in, like in the years that I worked here before. So um, I think volunteerism would be great to cultivate. So Rudy is here and he's sharing with us um, how his memories of how lively and fun it was to walk through the halls of the Brunswick Avenue Talmud Torah when you were there for activities and there would just be so many kids and so much hustle and bustle. Hine matov umanayim, right? How good it is for brothers and for people to live together. You, oh, Rudy saw Bambi here in 1958. <laughs> Fantastic. The first, okay, so Rudy's saying he saw Bambi here on the film screen that they had in the lobby, it sounds like, um, when it aired in, when it was released in 1958, and then when the Ed Sullivan Show featured the Beatles for their first televised appearance, there was a TV in the fitness center. This is a great story. Um, and you got to see the, with a bunch of people here, I'm presuming, that you got to watch it together with other people. Yeah, that's fantastic. Got to see the Beatles here on TV. This yeah. organically, because of all of you and your uh, curiosity and your knowledge and your incredible memory of memories, Rudy, um, I just want to say that I, I didn't want to disturb the flow because it just went so organically. Um, so first of all, um, I want to please uh, our at-home audience, our in-person audience, join me in a well-deserved round of applause for... Sharoni, for this is a huge um, period of history that is so important, not just to our downtown Y and JCC community, but the Toronto Jewish history and beyond. And I just want to say to just if anybody wasn't sure, this presentation did not exist before now. Sharoni went and took, I don't know, I don't even want to guess, just like Joron last week, countless hours. Yeah, I didn't have a uh, book that told me no, the whole history. No, there's no, there is, so <laughs> he this had a is, book. so here's what's interesting. This is, um, some of you who are um, at home and some of you who are here may have seen, if you, if you haven't seen Joron's lecture, we're going to be making it available for everyone. But what Joron was saying last week was that they were very good back then 
about documentation and about archiving. And somewhere along the line, after the 1950s, it started to digress. And I do believe, um, in my humble opinion, it actually ties to what you were saying about volunteerism. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the one exception I will proudly say, representing the incredible, incredible volunteerism of the active um, adult daytime yeah. uh, program. But why is that? because it was that era, it was that generation. It's not to take anything away from everybody today, but I was even saying to one of our volunteers who was here early this morning setting up Rhoda Sion that there was an altruism and um, a, a level of involvement that was just a little bit different, and it literally built these fraternalistic clubs and organizations. And when Sharoni was asking me um, you know, about how to craft this and how to distill it, because there was so much, one of the pieces that I, I was out of the room for a bit, so I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but David Earl? Um, no, I oh. just want to mention, um, some of you who know me know that my family, um, we were a, a Holocaust survivor family. What one important piece for a lot of the Jewish refugees who were coming to Toronto at that time and to all of the JCCs across North America, these places, these fraternal organizations and societies with the benevolent societies and all of the supports that Sharoni mentioned, they literally became their support system and their families. So, um, you know, everything that everyone is mentioning here today all of it combined created, I think, like a really incredible platform and then like a tiered cake, you know, like the architecture in New York. And then it just built up and built up and built up. And um, so that was very long. But what I wanted to say, just um, one more thing, is we're going to have a little bit more time um, after we have a little bit of more formality um, with some announcements. But there are some ladies who are in the room with us and you, you probably didn't know, but, but I saw that early in your slideshow presentation, when you were going through some of the memorabilia and you showed the slide in the fitness center of the shot and the gentleman and, and Phyllis, and, um, and um, you were in the back and you got all excited because you looked at those names and you said, I know those names, I knew those names. And, and, I, and I got goosebumps because you, the people who are gathered in this room, you are also the living history of our day. You hold these precious memories and fabric of our community. And so I'm elated that we all were able to come together on the occasion of the 70th anniversary to be together, especially after the time that we have just all emerged from. And now here we are. And the question was asked, what are the programs that we can come back? Well, guess what? We're surrounded in the room with memorabilia. There are old flyers and posters. There's so much over here that you know we can peruse. Um, our director of marketing created a fabulous um, online um, uh, tribute on our website. So if you can't be in our building, you can peruse our history online as well. And so um, I really want to thank all of you for coming today, um, both in person and virtually, to be a part of today. So. Um, thank you very, very much. Oh. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce Brian Pouquier, President of the Miles and Adele JCC Board of Directors, to say a few words. Thank you, Lisa. I won't, I won't be long. Um, Lisa and Harriet asked me to um, say a few words and come say hello, so I'm happy to oblige. Um, Sharoni, that was terrific. It really warmed my heart to see all of the ways that this building and organization contributed to the Jewish and larger community over the last number of decades. Um, but it also got me thinking that that, like any healthy ecosystem, uh, that contribution is not at all a one-way street. And really, um, the success of the organization 
is in part fueled by the contributions that each of you and you uh, online um, are providing to us um, as an institution. So I wanted to thank you for coming today, but, but really broader than that, for, for participating generally in the JCC and its programs, and um, wanted just to let everybody know that that participation um, is appreciated um, from the organization, and really it, what boomerangs back and helps us provide programs and services back to you and to the rest of the community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for your ongoing leadership and support of our JCC. Um, we did have one question uh, just uh, from the, the Zoom room. Um, thank you so much uh, to our at-home virtual audience. So this is interesting. I think it's more of an open-ended uh, question, something for the organization to think about. Will you compile a book of the history of the Miles Nadell JCC? What a wonderful question. And um, last week with Deron, um, it also gave him food, the same kind of food for thought about um, you know, documenting this very important and rich history. So I think that um, whoever asked that, you're uh, spot on. And <laughs> thank you very much for planting uh, a seed with us. So amazing. So um, I'm just going to um, uh, summarize very quickly that uh, the mention of the beloved uh, dances at our JCC. And um, there is a, um, there's a binder uh, over there, uh, for those of you who are in the room, um, with some memorabilia, and uh, I, I found uh, a flyer for, I think, the very first dance here. They were remarkable. I constantly, constantly have um, people in our community who come up to me at our programs and say, I met my spouse, I met my partner, I met my husband, I met my best friend at one of your dances. And the look of elation and love and uh, happiness is always the same. And um, so that's a, a, a great memory and uh, something that, so why, so why can't we bring them back? So it's, again, these are all fabulous ideas. And I think that part of why we wanted to have the memorabilia around the room is to bring back these memories. And like Lauren was saying, what are the beloved programs that excited everybody and created these special memories that we might be able to look at bringing back? So I think that that was fabulous. Okay, so since we were just mentioning arts and culture and it being such an important part of our history and the programs that we offer, to entertain us now with a special anniversary song is our executive director, Harriet Witchin, director of community programming, Esther Arbid, and Lauren Schreiber Sasaki, associate director of Jewish community inclusion and engagement. Come on up. Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself part of the family. For 70 years, that's long. It's clear you're here because you belong. The Bloor JCC South Y, the YMHA, part of our history. History. There's always, always a lot to do for young, old. The J's got it all for you. Nobody tries to be la dee da uppity. We welcome everyone, no fuss. And we will greet you with and try to learn your name. And the bagels are on us. <laughs> Consider yourself our friends for 70 years or more. It all began right here in 1953. The Miles Nadal. Miles Nadal. Miles Nadal. JCC. On behalf of everybody here, our staff, our board of directors, our volunteers, and me, it was just so wonderful connecting with all of you today. And we all look forward to seeing you again soon, either in person or virtually at the Miles Nadal JCC. Thank you.